thee. Good morning. Worship. <clears throat> Coming together. You know, interestingly, the first uh, mention of the word worship in the Bible is actually was in the Hebrew, of course, word shakal, but where it basically means the same thing. It was first used when Abraham took Isaac and he said that the Lord had commanded him to go up on this mountain and worship. Interesting, isn't it? Go and worship. Go to do it. You know, throughout the centuries, throughout biblical history, God has commanded his people to go and to worship, to go to the temple. It wasn't good enough to stay in their hometown. They needed to go to the temple and worship. They needed to go and to gather and to be together. They needed to be one people in one place with one accord, with one focus, and with one goal. And worship became, uh, uh, became the cornerstone of the Jewish faith, right? The temple was the cornerstone of Judaism. The idea of going to go to the temple and going to worship. That became a, a huge thing. And then when the Israelites were carried off into Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. or Jerusalem was taken and Judah was carried off into captivity, then the Jews began to do synagogue worship where they had places in, in these towns where Jesus would go into the synagogues in Galilee. But that didn't exist until Babylonian captivity. But they would go into the synagogues and they would, and they would use, they would chant most of, of that Jewish idea, Jewish singing would be to chant, and they would and they would read from the scroll of the scripture, and then they would be allowed to speak or be allowed to teach, and that was a setting that Jesus did a lot of his teaching, and Paul did a lot of his teaching, where they went into the synagogues, and they would be able to teach and expound upon the word of God, but when Jesus came and the church started on the day of Pentecost, things began to change, didn't they? You know, Pentecost, the word penna means 50. 50 days after Passover Sabbath. So the Sabbath would have been on a Saturday or the last day of the week. So Pentecost is on the first day of the week. So the church was actually started on the first day of the week. And it became tradition for Christians to meet on the first day of the week in order to worship God. It was something they came to do. Something they gathered to do. It was not something they did from a distance or in their own place. It was something that they made an effort to meet and to do that together. Because there's things involved in worship we're going to look at this morning that truthfully we can only do when we're together. You know, we've been in a hard place, haven't we, with COVID and with virtual, and the building was empty and we were online and people were worshiping in their own homes. They were partaking of the Lord's Supper in their own homes. They were, they were listening to the lesson. They were singing the songs. They were doing all that in the comfort of our living room. And I guess that was kind of nice. People said it's nice being able to get up in your pajamas and, and watch the sermon. And I understand that. But the truth is, is there's reason that God calls us to be together as a people. And there's things, literally, that we cannot do unless we are physically together as a group. And that's something I think that we need to understand biblically, uh, the meaning of that, and what we are supposed to do, and what worship should be between us. It's a passion of mine, worship. I think it's something that, that we need to be serious about. It's something that we need to contemplate. It's something that's important. It's important to me. It's important to my family and my kids growing up to be here and to be with you. My children are pew babies, and some of the kids here are pew babies. They grew up with you. They know you. There's an advantage to that. There's things that they get from that that they couldn't get if they weren't physically in your presence, physically with you. You know, when Pentecost came and the church started, and it's what we call the end gathering, it's where people stayed in Jerusalem because they really thought that it was going to... Uh, Jesus would come really quickly, and they're not going to get into the communal aspect of that this morning. But there's things in that, especially in Acts 2.42, and of course, if we go on down in Acts just a little bit further than this, there's another place of this, but specifically, I wanted to look at this this morning. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You know, this is a continual thing they were doing, a continual thing. And, and in, this, in this beginning of the church, in this beginning of, of church history, of what we would call modern church history, um, there was things they were doing. And those things are an example, given to us an example of things that you and I should do in worship, things you and I should do together. And there's things here I think we can see, and four specific things they did here. 
And we need to look at those. One thing is they were involved in the apostles' teaching. You know, they didn't just come together. There was a biblical context to it. They were devoting themselves, the Bible says, to the teaching. So when we come together, that's something we should do. And throughout biblical times, that's something that was done. In the Old Testament, whether it was the scrolls that were brought out in synagogue or that were read aloud in the temple, even if you go back to the days when the temple was restored and, and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah read God's word from the scrolls, the reading of God's word, the opening of scripture is something that was a constant throughout all this, the word of God and opening that up. And in this case, the apostles teaching, not Old Testament teaching we're talking about here, not going back into the Old Testament scrolls, but this a New Testament idea. This is the apostles' teaching that they're looking at. And so when we come on a Sunday morning and we get together together on the first day of the week, that's something we need to be concerned about is the teaching. We need to be able to learn. And when we leave here, I hope when you leave here, I hope that maybe you leave with more questions than answers. I hope that you, I hope that it makes you think. I hope I can make you think. I hope that you get something from that and from God's Word. And even if it's just a little bit of something, I hope you carry something away with you because that's such a vital, important part of what we do when we come together. But you know, another thing they did, and, it's, and Luke really mentions this, doesn't it? And that's fellowship. You know, fellowship comes in a lot of ways, doesn't it? You know, I've often said that it's really easy for us to get along if we never spend any time together. You agree with that? You know, I can get along with anybody for, you know, 15, 20 minutes a week or whatever. I mean, I can say hi to you and smile, and even if I don't like you, I probably can get along, right? But, you know, when we're fellowshipping with one another, we're spending time with one another, we're eating with one another and gathering around tables, and, and those things that we do and we need to do, that's really what fellowship is. Fellowship's not just about coming together and meeting each other at the door and saying, how are you doing? Well, everything's great, which it probably isn't, but we say that. And then we, and, and then leaving and shaking our hands and leaving on the way out and saying, oh, have a good week, right? Have a blessed week. Okay, we'll see you, see you next Sunday, right? You know, that's really not what it's talking about. It's talking about knowing one another, fellowshipping with one another, eating with one another, talking to one another, outside of here. And when we do that and start putting ourselves in our lives, in each other's lives, and that's what they were doing, and that's what we need to do. You know, it's so important for me that we have that connection, that relationship. You know, I was talking this morning, and somehow my back popped up two or three times in that incident, amongst many other incidents in my life, too numerous to mention. But, but I, you know, one of those things that we was talking about that, and then over here we started talking about it. And you know, one thing I just can't imagine going through that without all of you. You know, you just don't know what that means. I mean, I was at the hospital, next thing you know, people are there, people are calling, people are praying. You don't know what that means. And that's relationship. That's more than just being here. That's people that know me. I've known some of you, I've known some of you in here your entire lives, right? And I've known a lot of other people in here for a lot, a lot of years. And that's relationships, that's what this fellowship is. It's more than just saying, oh, I go to church with you. It's more than that. It's about saying, yeah, I know your children, and I know your mother's having health issues and I know this is going on in your life that's what fellowship is and that's what this is about and that's what they were about and that's what we need to be about but in Acts 242 it says there and interestingly and I guess maybe this doesn't mean anything unless you kind of look at Greek a little bit but interestingly in the Greek all these things have a definite article and that really means a lot in the Greek the word oh oh in the definite article or the is what we say and all of these things that they do, if you really read that, they all have a definite article in front of them. They were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, not to fellowship, interestingly, but to the fellowship and to the, and to the breaking of the bread. And that's important because here in this situation, where later on it says they were taking their meals together with gladness, if you read on down a little bit in Acts, but here it says the breaking of the bread. And that's important because when we're talking about it here, we're talking about communion. We're talking about what we do on Sunday morning. So an integral part of their worship from the very beginning, Jesus instituted that, right? But a very integral part of their worship from the very beginning was the taking of the bread, the taking of the Lord's Supper. That was important to them right from the very beginning. That's something that started at Pentecost. That's something that started early on. It is something that they included within their love feast, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And the other thing is, they devoted themselves to prayer. 
They devoted themselves to prayer. You know, so those four things are right there in the beginning of this, of this text and right in the beginning of the church, the beginning of what we would call the New Testament church. And we talk about restoring New Testament Christianity. There's four things here that we see. One is they devoted themselves to the teaching of God's Word, to the fellowship with one another. We can't have fellowship if we're not together. It's just really, really hard to do. I guess we could Zoom now. We, I guess they call that, right, Zoom, or what do they call that, Microsoft Teams. But I don't think it's the same thing. You can't fellowship unless you're together. And then they broke the bread together, and they prayed together. So there's a lot of things that were going on here early on in the church. But if we move past this a little bit, there's other things that we do in worship. You know, Paul talks about this, and it's something that you and I did just a minute ago. We instruct each other. You know, and you say, well, how can that be? You're the preacher, you get up, you give the lesson, we listen to you, right? But the truth is, when you come in here on a Sunday morning, we all teach each other. That's what Paul says. You listen to the words of the songs we sang this morning? You know what Paul says about that? Paul says that we, I will tell you, Paul says we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. You know, when you sing here on a Sunday morning, you're not just singing to God or singing to the front. We're singing to one another. We forget that sometimes. We're singing to each other. There's messages in those songs. There's truth in those songs. Off we come together. Off we sing and pray. Right? You know, there's truth. We're t talking to one another, teaching each other. Matter of fact, Paul says in Colossians 3.16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell with, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You know, it's not possible for us to sing to one another when we're not together, is it? So there's certain aspects of what we do in worship that can only be done when we meet, when we're together, when we're in one place with one accord. You know, another thing we do in worship, but the reason I bring this passage up is not necessarily because I think it's a good passage on giving. Matter of fact, I think it's kind of a misused passage on giving just between me and you because this is for a specific gift for the church in Jerusalem that Paul was talking about. But the reason I bring this passage up is because it tells when they were coming together. It says, on the first day of each week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. On the first day of the week. You know, so when we come together, it's not just about how we come together. It's about when we come together, what we do when we're together, what's on our hearts when we're together, how we leave each other when we're together. There's a lot here with worship. The very word worship comes from the Greek word proskuneo. It means to prostrate yourself before God, literally to come and bet on your face, bow on your face before the Lord is what it means. We come here with a humble heart and a humble spirit and a contrite heart, you might say, and a heart that's ready to absorb God's word and to listen and to be with one another and admonish one another and talk to one another. And we should leave here lifted up and better than we were when we came. We should leave here better because that's what worship is about. But it's about God. You know, unfortunately in our society, I see more and more churches and have had conversations with a lot of people who, who do who do music, the guy specifically that I'm friends with that does music ministry in all kinds of big churches. And, and me and him had some really good conversations. And you, you know what he told me? He says, Christianity in America, not talking necessarily about Church of Christ, this is across denominations. But he told me, he says, and this is a guy who's been in ministry for a lot of years, he told me, he says, Christianity in America is no longer about worship. And I thought that was a profound statement coming from this, from this individual. He said, Christianity in America is no longer about worship. He said, Christi every church, he said, 90% of the churches in America are simply seeker churches. In other words, what he's saying is they want to put on enough of a show. They want to put on enough. All they're worried about is getting people in, getting up the numbers, and keeping people there. And this is the guy who's been doing this for 40 years of his life. 
And he says, churches are no longer about worship. And that's really profound to me. You know, I was raised partially Catholic. Can you be that? Can you partially something? I was partially Catholic in my upbringing. And you know, there's a lot of things about the Catholic Church that I don't agree with, obviously, and a lot of doctrinal things I don't agree with, obviously. But there's one thing about Catholicism that always appealed to me. And that's that when you go into Catholic Mass on a Sunday morning, or of course they do it every day, but on a Sunday morning, when you go into Catholic Mass, it's all about worship. It's not about anything else. Not trying to convert people, not trying to change, it's just about worship. Brethren, there's a time in our lives when we just need to be about worship. Putting our hearts in the right place, our minds in the right place, our bodies in the right place, and doing those things that God commands us to do to worship Him. That's so important to me. You know, our worship has become very traditional, hasn't it? You know, one thing I can give you no example of in the New Testament is an invitation song. No example of that in the New Testament. That's a, that's a traditional thing, isn't it? You know, the truth of the matter is, brethren, is that you and I need to get back to the art and to the habit and to the focus of worshiping with each other, of being together with each other. I know it's hard. We got out of that. And there's, and there's habits in life. I understand that. And coming to church a lot of times becomes a habit. It's something you get up and you do. And I've been there. I sat in these pews a whole lot longer than I've ever stood up here in this pulpit. And I know all the trials of getting up with children and getting to church and all the things that go on in cars before you get to church on a Sunday morning. I'm well aware. Well aware. Been there. I've done all those things in my life. Right? But I was always here because... It was, sometimes it was habit. Is that wrong to say that? I don't think so. Sometimes habits carry us through. It wasn't always because I loved the preacher that was there. I thought it was the, I was going to have the best day or whatever, but it's something that I did. And when we fall out of a habit, it's hard for us to get back into a habit. And the truth is, with this COVID thing and being able to stay at home, a lot of us, it's easy to fall out of the habit of being in worship of getting up and getting dressed and getting our kids and being where we need to be. But I'm telling you, it's so critically important that we get back into that habit. It's so critically important we get back into the, this idea of worship. You know, if you want your children to be faithful, be faithful. I mean, I can't, I can't stress that enough. You know, parents that come to me and say, I just don't understand why my kids aren't, aren't faithful. I don't understand why they're... And I'm like, if you want your kids to be faithful, then show them what it is to be faithful. Show them what it is to get up every Sunday morning and get to church and get ready and get there. And even if it's not the best day on earth, to be where you need to be and do what you need to do. You know, God's no different than the God of the Old Testament. He's telling you, He's telling all of us to get up and to get together and to worship Him. Worship is, is too bidirectional, isn't it? It's about a vertical relationship, looking towards God, and yet it's a horizontal thing about looking to each other, about looking to one another and encouraging one another, and being there for one another, and having a relationship with one another. And there's a couple, three people, four people here that I haven't seen in a long time, and it's just so good to see their faces. I just can't tell you how good it is to see their faces this morning. I can't tell you how good it is to see people back, because, because I missed you. I missed all of you being here. When it was just me and my family here, and we were doing the live streaming, it was just not, it was just not, it was just not what it should be. Because what it should be is all of us together. And if we're not together, we're not, we're not where we should be. The church is the people. It's not the building. This building is just sheet rock and paint. And until you're sitting in here, the church is not in here. But when you're sitting in this building, the church is here. And when you leave, it's not here anymore. This is just a building. And never forget that. You're important. You're integral. You're necessary to the worship of the Lord. And we always have to remember that when we, when we talk about the subject, I believe. Worship can be vain. Worship can be, worship can be worthless in the Scripture. Jesus says, why do you worship worthless, worthless things upon my altar? Why do you bring the blind, the blind and the lame and the sick? Why do you do that? But worship can be the most powerful tool, powerful thing towards God if it's done with the heart of a Christian and the attitude that it should be done with. In Acts chapter 27, it says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. 
And I'm just here to tell you this morning, he didn't start preaching at 1140 either. Just telling you that, right? So, but he preached till midnight, right? Because he preached, because that's how they came together. But why did they come together? They come together on the first day of the week to break bread. There was a reason, a purpose, a function of why they gathered, of why they came together. Jim said this morning, these emblems that we take, these emblems that we take every Sunday, they mean something to us. That's our communion with God. It's our participation in the death of Jesus Christ. It's our participation with one another in partaking of that. When we sit here and we do that together, I was thinking this morning, though, the sound of communion used to be the clinking of trays. Now it's the crinkling of plastic. But, but needless to say, it's communion, and we're together, and we're doing that together. And it's important that we do, that we do these things. It's important that we do these things. Jesus, God, calls us to do it. In Acts 27, in this passage, when Paul was there, he was taking this, this meal, and he, and he took that meal. You know, if we look at Jude, which I didn't put that scripture up this morning in front of you, but if you look at the book of Jude, Jude he talks about the love feast, creeping in unaware in the love feast. If we look at 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about the Lord's Supper and how they're not taking that in the way they should anymore, that one's drunk and another's hungry, but yet he commends them, he says, you know, to, to examine and consider the blood and the body of Jesus Christ when you commune with him. But once again, it gets into that same idea. Why were they together? They were together to break bread. They were together to take the Lord's Supper. They were together to do those things that God wanted them to do. You know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, that's kind of a new, not a new thing. In the scope of history, it's a new thing. It's a pretty old thing for here. Did they do that? Probably not. They probably met all day. I mean, the context of the New Testament is when they showed up, they brought their dinner, right? I mean, they were planning on staying. It was probably a long walk to get there. They were going to spend the entire day together. They were going to eat their meal. They were going to spend the day. That's what they're talking about in Jude when it talks about the agape feast or the love feast that people are creeping into unawares. They were going to spend the entire day together. Now, now we don't do that, do we? Now we kind of break it up. We have a morning and an evening, and that's the way the elders have set that up. My bulletin article talks about that. You want to read that when it comes out Sunday, next week when you get it. Um, and so we kind of have that different type of format now. But it's the same idea. We come together at a certain time to do certain things in a certain way together to worship God. Because that's our example. That's a possibilistic example of what God has called us to do. And what Christ has called us to do as members of his kingdom. You and I have a responsibility are we commanded to worship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we commanded to assemble? Absolutely. You know, we talk about God doesn't give a lot of commands in the Bible, but these are things that are important to him, important for us to do. And that day of the week, the first day of the week in the New Testament, became such a day of reverence, such a day of importance, that Paul called it, or John calls it in Revelation 1.10, he calls it the Lord's Day. And early on, and that's what it was called, and that's what I've heard it called a lot of my life, I was on the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. That day becomes so important that it was the Lord. Is it the Sabbath? No, it's not. The Sabbath is on Saturday. The Sabbath is a Jewish day. Is it a day of Christian worship, the first day of the week? Absolutely. My whole life I was taught it was a Christian Sabbath. I don't really believe that's a true way. My whole life I was taught, you know, we need to rest because it's Sunday. I don't necessarily know that that's true. It's not the Christian Sabbath. It's unique. And that's one reason I think early Christians worshipped on the first day of the week. Because they didn't want it to be confused. They didn't want it to be the Sabbath. They wanted it to be the day that the church started, the day of Pentecost, the day that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, the first day of the week. The first day of the week is a day that became important to them. And traditionally and historically and by apostolic example, we know they came together on the first day of the week. And that's why we meet on the first day of the week. That's why we do the things that we do on the first day of the week. That's why we come together and we sing and we pray and we teach and we have fellowship with one another. And we do all those things that are commanded by us to do. People always say, when does... People are, the world kind of has this view, right? And I hear this from people. I've worked, I've worked on a lot of trucks in my life. I know a lot of truck drivers have done that my whole life. And I know a lot of truck drivers that are pretty religious guys. And I've had a, several of them truck drivers over the years tell me, they say, I just worship in my truck going down the road. I don't need anybody. I just worship in my truck going down the road. 
And I say, well, I think you can worship by yourself. But I think to worship as God calls us to do on the first day of the week, I'm sorry, but I don't think you can do that in your truck going down the road. I don't think you can. I think you're going to have to stop your truck and find some Christians and worship. Because corporate worship is a different idea. People always say, why is it different at 1030? Why does everything change at 1030? What's that about that? I said, because that's when the elders said, that's when we're going to do those things that we're required to come together and do. If it was 5 o'clock in the morning, that would be, well, it wouldn't be all right with me, but it would be okay, right? But, you know, it's that time that the elders have set that time aside and says, this is the time we're going to meet. This is the time we're going to do those things required to worship. This is the time we're going to do that thing. And it is different. It is a different time. It's a different setting. It should be. It should have a different reverence and a different meaning to it. Because the truth is, is that that is what God calls us to do. The world often confuses that. Many times a day we hear the word praise and worship used interchangeably, and they're not interchangeable, and they're never used together in the Scripture. It's a different idea. Two different words in the Greek. Never forget, the word worship means to fall on your face before God. It's a whole different word than praise. Never used together in the Bible, because it's a different idea. When we come together here on Sunday morning to give and to sing and to partake of this table, it's a different time for a Christian. It's a time we come together to do what God calls us to do. And we should never forget that. It's reverent. It's important. And it should be. And it happens every week, every first day. You know, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, let us not... Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking your own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day growing near. If you got your Bible with you this morning, or if you look at your Bible on your phone, however you do that this morning, but if you got your Bible this morning, I want you to turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 10 don't often ask you to do that. I try to make it easy on you. But I think it's important for us to look at the context a little bit of this passage before we quit this evening to give you the idea of the seriousness of this. And let's back up just a little bit. Let's go to 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then look at 24, and we're going to go a little bit past this. And let us consider, see it's all in the same thing. You see the and in there? So all this goes together. And then he says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And this is what he says, not forsaking the assembling not as forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. So there's a habit in not assembling, isn't there? He says, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What I want you to look at in this passage, and I know it's a new paragraph in the Greek when we get to 25, 26, but I want you to look at immediately what follows what I just read. And I want you to listen to these words if you don't have your Bible. If you have your Bible, I want you to read these words with me. But if you don't, I want you to listen to what this says. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now you can say, well, that's a break, Rex. That's a different paragraph in the Greek. But I'm telling you, that immediately follows assembling with each other. So is it a sin not to assemble? I absolutely believe that it is. You and I have a command to assemble with each other, to be together, to encourage one another, to lift one another up, to be there for one another. We have a command to come to worship. To come to worship and to do those things that we have a apostolic example to do. To sing, to pray, to take the Lord's Supper. We have an example to do that and a command to do that. And it's important that we do that. And I know that we've had extenuating circumstances I understand that. And I understand that that hasn't been possible to do 
I understand that, and I'm sympathetic to that. I am. I do understand that. So don't take it that I'm getting on people for not being here when you couldn't be here. I'm not doing that. Please don't take this wrong. I'm not doing that respect at all. So don't take this wrong. But what I'm telling you is it's time to be back. That's what I'm telling you. It's time to be back together. It's time to make the effort. It's time to be here. The vaccine's out. You can get it if you want it. It's time to be back together. And brethren, we have a command to do that. And we can do so much together that we can't do apart. It's so encouraging for me to be here with you. It's so encouraging for me to be here with people that I love and care about and people that I want to go to heaven with. And I hope it is for you too. You know, when I look at this auditorium and I look at all of you in here, I just can't imagine my life without you. This is just as important to me as spending time with my own family. Sometimes more important probably. It really is. This is, my, this is our family. This is my family. My family's here. Praise the Lord. But you're my family. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. I care about you. I desire the best for you. And more than anything, one day a week, at least one day a week, I like to do it three days a week with you, but I'll take what I can get. At least one day a week, I want to sit here with you together, and I want to take the Lord's Supper together, and I want to hear our voices blending together in praise and worship Jesus Christ. That's important to me. And I hope that it's important to you. If you need the prayers of this congregation, if we can assist you in any way this morning, would you let it be known as we stand?